this chapter was a cliffhanger on steroids. We get to see so many things and go to so many different places and yet find out so little. It's a gold mine to speculate on. So we start off with Capone and Chiffon arriving at the port, one of the ports of Dress Rosa, and we see that Capone has defeated some Marines that were guarding the entrance. It's a good thing to note that the Marines were not totally irresponsible, and they left some fodder in Dress Rosa to guard the ports of entry. Then that guy with the guitar confuses Chiffon for Lola, which to me is a very clear indicator that he's going to be helping by pointing us in Lola's direction. I have to make a brief correction about the number that uh, Frankie stated uh, last week when he said that the ships should be able to hold 10,000 men. According to the official translation, it's actually 100,000, which to me is kind of crazy and it just doesn't add up because I definitely do not see 100,000 guys to show up against Kaido. So I think one of two things, either that was a typo um, and I think it should still be 10,000 or those ships are going to be used later after Wano in the final war of One Piece. And then maybe maybe Luffy's allies will add up to that number of 100,000, but not, not here in Wano. Or maybe a lot of those ships are going to be destroyed in the fight against Kaido to the point where that number of 100,000 doesn't matter anyway. So maybe it's just Frankie playing it really, really, really safe. But the chapter actually starts in Fishman Island with Garp and King Neptune and Shida Hoshi, and Garp is basically commenting on the fact that the world of One Piece, politically, is very similar to our own because people are motivated by self-interest and greed and a lust for power, and countries can't get along because of those reasons. I like how Garp is served hot tea in a bubble. So he just grabs the tea and the little bubble dissolves into his own. <laughs> And then the scene ends abruptly with Garp revealing that there was a huge incident involving the Alabasta Kingdom as soon as Shidahoshi and King Neptune left the reverie. I kind of think that the incident should be connected to the fact that King Cobra, which is Vivi's father, requested an audience with the Gorosei in the beginning of the reverie. The reason for why this problem could involve Vivi is that when we see Emu, um, he's in this chamber, I think it's called the Chamber of Flowers or something, and we see the torn up pictures or bounty posters of Luffy, Blackbeard, and a picture of Shidahoshi. The only poster that is not teared up is a picture of Vivi. So Emu grabs that picture of Nefertari Vivi and walks away. And then in the next scene, the elders are literally bowing and asking Emu, which light do you want us to extinguish from history this time around? So it can be very possible that Emu decided that the Nefertari family should be the one to go, especially if you consider the fact, and this is something that we learned back in Dressrosa from Doflamingo, but one of the elders repeats it, uh, the Nefertari family, out of uh, the, the old, old kingdoms, uh, the 20 kingdoms that essentially created the world government, the only family uh, out of those uh, 20 kingdoms that decided that they were not going to live up in Marajoa, that they would rather stay on the surface and, and live uh, with the rest of the people, was the Nefertari family. So even though the Nefertari family is one of the founders of the world government, and they have royal, technically they have like a royal bloodline, it sounds like the top dogs kind of resent them for that decision, to the point where even one of the elders says that they should be considered traitors. And since this is the first cliffhanger of many that we get in this chapter, it would have been cool for Garp to end the scene by breaking the fourth wall and staring at the reader, taking his cup and going, and that's the tea. Just a reminder, Alabasta also happens to be the location of the poneglyph that spells out the location of one of the ancient weapons. In this case, it's Pluton. So maybe that's what got compromised and that's what the government is trying to handle right now. Then we go to the World Economic Times, which is the office of Big News Morgans. And Big News Morgans has a commitment to the truth. He is set on being honest and you know having very, very ethical journalistic standards. His journalistic integrity is on point, you know, the same type of integrity that got him to publish the news about Luffy being a Yonko. And then when Luffy actually fought a Yonko, he got one-shotted. Anyway, there's like a government official that hands Morgans a check to alter the news. And I like how Morgans takes one look at that check and he's like, oh no, you gotta do better than this. I wonder if the mask that the government agent is wearing is the same type of mask that Sanji wore 
back in Whole Cake Island that used Germatech to conceal the fact that his face had been beat up. Morgan says that there were three major things that happened in the reverie. The first one is a death. The second one is the abolishment of the Shichibukai system. And the third one is an assassination attempt. And then Wabo calls in with a fourth by the end of that scene. And the chapter spends a lot of time heavily implying that the person who died was actually Sabo. But, um, no. I think it's the same type of trick that we got in last week's chapter, where it was also heavily implied that La was the traitor and that he was reporting back to Orochi. It's the same kind of thing. Especially because, like, these things happen off screen, so it's kind of like we, we have a lot of missing information. If Sabo actually died off screen, that would be very, very disappointing. But I think the point of reporting that is to get Dragon to go over there so that the Marines can capture the Revolutionary Army. Which is interesting because I actually thought that Dragon had gone to the Reverie. Because at one point, as they're heading up towards Marajoa, I think somebody mentions that the wind is very strong. And usually when the wind is strong, that's a sign that Dragon is close by. So it looks like the revolutionaries are thinking about going to Marajoa to find out for themselves what actually happened to Sabo. I can't believe I'm saying this, but in this case, I think it's a very good thing that the people of Wano do not have access to the news. Because can you imagine what would actually happen if Luffy read this on the front page of the newspaper? After the news breaks about Sabo, this is where the chapter turns into a live reaction mashup. We get a shot of Steli reacting to the news, we get a shot of Dadan and the Mountain Bandits reacting to the news, we get a shot of Makino. Her baby is so depressed, her baby is so deep in denial about Sabo's death, that he's actually smiling and playing with a ball. Which I think is another hint to the fact that Sabo isn't dead. Because if, if he were actually dead, Oda wouldn't have a baby laughing, playing with a ball in a reaction shot. Like he would just have Makino crying her eyes out. So that baby gave it away. <laughs> the world sure is full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to see Doflamingo, but uh, wasn't there like an assassin heading over to Impel Down to get him? I think that's what I remember, that like he mentioned an assassin was going to get him, so apparently that assassin failed. We also get a brief shot of Blackbeard in this chapter, who's about to leave Honeycomb Island and set sail to get that thing to stop the Marines from getting it first. The question here is, which thing is he referring to? Is he talking about getting the meta meta no me? Since he thinks that Sabo is dead, that, that's something that he might be interested in. Do you think that maybe he's going to get one of those thick road poneglyphs? Or is he going to go and get one of those thick ancient weapons? We then get a very important conversation between Kobe and X Drake. And in both of the translations that I read, Kobe very, very heavily implies that there won't be any admirals going to Wano because their hands are full. Because the Marines are going to be very busy trying to arrest all of the Shichibukai and they're also going to be busy handling whatever that incident was regarding Alabasta. So even though I still have like a little bit of hope that an admiral or admirals will show up in Wano eventually, Kobe essentially says in this chapter to Drake, yeah, don't, don't count on it. Also, Kobe has been promoted to a rear admiral because he used to be a captain, but now he's a rear admiral. That was, that was nice to read. Um, but I think most importantly, like if an admiral was heading over to Wano, I think a rear admiral such as Kobe would know if that were the case. So after this chapter, it's looking a lot less likely that an admiral will show up in Wano, especially because Kobe also says that Wano really isn't part of the world government. It, it doesn't fall under their umbrella. So right now it's not a priority. But who knows, perhaps the news about Big Mom and Kaido forming an alliance and teaming up can change that. Now the fact that Drake turned out to be a secret agent, or rather an agent for a secret initiative within the Marines is, is crazy, but it also adds more depth to uh, a lot of stuff. Because I feel like the people that are part of the S.W.O.R.D. initiative, those are the guys that I think are going to be leading the Marines 
by the end of the series, by the end of the show. I think Kobe, I think, is destined to become Fleet Admiral. And I've always said that just because the Marines are technically the antagonistic force in the story, that doesn't make all Marines bad. So I think what Oda is setting up is that the people that eventually, the, the, the members of S.W.O.R.D., right, uh, agents, agents of sorry, uh, those are the good guys, and I think Oda by the end of the story is going to make that distinction very, 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 very clear. So the people that will eventually lead the Marines will be the members of Sword. So I definitely see a lot of Marines joining Sword as we get closer to the end of the series. I see Garp and Sengoku joining if they don't already know about it. I see Fujitora. I see Smoker and Tashigi joining. I see Hina. All these solid like honest good core marines that you know they, they kind of don't agree with the way like akainu is running things now this is another thing back in sabodi archipelago there is a line that law has when we get introduced to the supernova uh law looks at drake and he's like hey drake how many people have you actually killed and it's so crazy if you rewatch that scene drake just stopped uruj and killer from clashing it's almost like he's trying to keep order it's like like a marine would do right but the question that law asks him is so telling because i think that's kind of like saying how many civilians how many civilians what's your body count drake so of course if he's actually working for the marines it would make sense that he does not have a body count that he hasn't been going around hurting people and i think law knows this and he's taunting drake in that scene and this is why drake was uncomfortable in that one that one scene that we got where hawkins was there and he had law pinned down like it literally looked like hawkins had won that fight but drake was right there next to hawkins and he was shaking he, he looked uncomfortable at the sight of law uh being captured and then the next time we see the guys uh hawkins has been defeated and law walks away and we see this shadowy figure so i think the, this chapter pretty much confirms that Drake was in fact the guy who allowed and helped Law to escape. And I think this also confirms that Law knows about Drake's secret identity. And I think this has to do with the fact that Corazon was also a secret agent for the Marines, just like ex-Drake was. Another very important thing that the chapter reveals indirectly is that the S.W.O.R.D. initiative is being kept secret from people like Akainu and Kizaru. And we know this because back in Sabori Archipelago, Kizaru actually attacks Drake. He just shows up in front of him and kicks him in the face. So if Kizaru knew that X Drake was working undercover, he probably would not have attacked him. And we know that Akainu doesn't know about the sword initiative because uh, back when we saw him last time, Akainu told Kizaru, like, wait a minute, Kizaru, don't go to Wano just yet because we do not know how strong these samurai guides are. So if X-Drake was giving intel to the Marines about Wano, it would make sense that he would pass that information about the samurai to Akainu. But Akainu seems to have no knowledge of, of how strong these samurai guys actually are. So I don't think X-Drake is reporting back to Akainu. In fact, it's pretty certain that he's not. So this sword operation is being run right under his nose. So you can just imagine how furious he's going to be when he finds out it exists. So what happened back in Reverie was that King Cobra and King Riku, who are both kings of kingdoms that fell victim to two Shichibukai, Crocodile and Doflamingo, they brought up the idea, which is actually not their idea, it was Fujitora's idea. And if you go back to the beginning of the Reverie, there's a moment where uh, I think Pell mentions that King Cobra, King Riku, and Fujitora uh, are having a meeting or they're talking to each other because Fujitora wanted to talk to them for, for the same reason. So it's actually Fujitora's idea. We, we knew this in just Dress Rosa to abolish the system of the Shichibukai. So the uh, decree or the motion passed and now the Shichibukai are being hunted. And we start off with Buggy. Ah! Also, Fujitora told Green Bull back in Marajoa that Vegapunk had actually invented something. We don't know what it was, but he said it was something incredible uh, that Vegapunk had invented that would allow the government to not need the Shichibukai anymore. So Stainless, who is a vice admiral in the Marines, was sent to capture Buggy. And I don't know who they sent to capture Mihawk, but if the Marines sent anything aside from an admiral, then the Marines are idiots. You need at least one admiral to stand a chance to try and capture Mihawk. At least. And that's the bare minimum. Because Mihawk is just sitting there chilling. 
just waiting for these guys to come knock on his door. I would like to see that fight though between Mihawk and an admiral. Then we go to Weevil and Miss Bocking on a certain island who are being surrounded by marines and they should have sent uh, a strong marine to handle Weevil as well. I kind of wanted to know what island Weevil was on, and so I actually went back and checked the chapter where we saw Marco and Nekumamushi, which I think was like Whitebeard's hometown, and I noticed that it can't be that island because the island where uh, Nekumamushi and Marco were, Whitebeard's island, had pine trees, and, and there aren't any pine trees in this island. Although I'm not gonna lie, there are some aspects of that island that look very, very similar to the one that Weevil was in, in this chapter. The chapter ends with Pirate Empress Boa Hancock, the most beautiful woman in the world, saying, not to worry, because the Kuja pirates are strong, and that's why she became a Shichibukai, or was offered the position in the first place. And so Kobe is heading over to capture her, and so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It'll be the battle of the Luffy-obsessed fans. See how they rank against each other. I'm kind of worried that all of these confrontations are going to get off-screen, though. But, uh, fingers crossed. A couple of noticeable absences from this chapter, in my opinion. I thought it was interesting that we didn't get to see Kuma, since we got to see the, the Shichibukai. We didn't get to see Kuma. We didn't get to see Crocodile, which normally when we get these, uh, news chapters, we, we kind of get a shot of Crocodile. And then I also thought it was super convenient that we didn't get to see Rebecca. And I'm saying this because Rebecca actually knows who Sabo is, and she was at the reverie. So her reaction would be very telling about the nature of, of the news about Sabo's death. Uh, you know, she would be like a really, really uh, valuable source of information in terms of how she's reacting to the news. Uh, but we didn't get to see her. So she should know what actually went down and I think Sai and Leo should also know what actually went down since they were there as well at Reverie, but we didn't get to see any of them. I thought the chapter was really good, like I said in the beginning. It's a gold mine to speculate about. So let me know your thoughts about the Sword Initiative, who founded it, what's it all about. Let me know who you think the assassination attempt that Morgans was talking about was on, who was that attempt on during the Reverie, and then also let me know what you think actually happened to Sabo. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Like the video if you did. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. This is the series of a lifetime, and I couldn't be happier to be able to have the opportunity to share these moments, these chapters, with you. So thanks a bunch. I'll catch you guys later. Take care. Bye.